10-Minute Murder. In a quiet corner of New Jersey, the story of Melanie Lynn McGuire and her husband Bill unfolded in a way that nobody could have seen coming. It's a story that has since gripped the nation, earning the moniker of the suitcase killer. The story takes us through the ordinary lives of a nurse and a computer programmer who, on the surface, seemed like any other married couple. Melanie Lynn McGuire, born 1972, had her roots in New Jersey, growing up in Ridgewood and Middletown Township. She attended Middletown High School South before embarking on her journey through Rutgers University, where she studied math and psychology. Melanie's ambitions led her to the Charles E. Gregory School of Nursing, where she graduated with distinction in 1997. It was in the late 90s when she married Bill McGuire, a Navy veteran born in 1964. Bill, a computer programmer, and Melanie, a nurse, built a life together. By April 2004, they'd been married for five years and were the proud parents of two sons. They lived in a modest apartment in Woodbridge Township, New Jersey, and they had their sights set on moving to a larger home in Warren County. But you know, life has a funny way of throwing us curveballs. And this story isn't all cozy and heartwarming. There was a twist, a tragic one, that shook their world and sent shockwaves through that small community. Now, Melanie and Bill's relationship had had its ups and downs, just like nearly any marriage. But you know how sometimes even the closest of couples can hit a rough patch? Well, they did too. Arguments, disagreements, the kind of stuff that can make or break a relationship. Melanie, the nurturing and caring nurse, and Bill, the hardworking provider, they started to drift apart. Life's demands can put pressure on any couple, and they were not immune to it. But beneath it all, there was still love and history between them. Or at least, that's how it seemed. And this is where things started to take a real turn. As if the tension in their relationship wasn't enough, there were rumors, whispers in the town. People started talking about possible infidelity and financial issues. And gossip has a way of spreading like wildfire in a small community. And these whispers added more fuel to that fire. People said they saw things heard things. And you know how it goes, right? In a town like this, word gets around, and the rumor mill stays running at full speed. Now, these allegations were more than just idle chatter. It's as if the storm clouds had gathered over the McGuire's life, casting a shadow on everything that they held dear. And then one day, Bill McGuire disappeared. Just like that, without a trace. No one knew where he'd gone, and the town was thrown into a state of uncertainty and disbelief. It's the kind of thing you'd expect in a crime novel or a movie, but not in your own hometown. Melanie, who was already dealing with her strained relationship, was suddenly thrust into a nightmare. She became the center of attention, and not in the way that she ever wanted to be. Everyone had questions, suspicions, and nobody had any answers at all. The McGuire house was left in disarray, as if Bill had just vanished into thin air. It was like a jigsaw puzzle you buy at a garage sale, with too many missing pieces to make sense of it. And the whole town was there trying to put it together. So as you can imagine, Melanie's reaction to her husband's sudden disappearance was anything but what people expected. She didn't seem as distraught as they'd assume, considering the circumstances. We all know individual people handle individual situations differently, but friends and family they noticed that something wasn't quite right. Melanie told a story, though, a story that she'd had her reasons for not sharing everything. She claimed Bill left on his own accord, not giving any indication of where he was headed. And she said it with her whole chest, straight face. But the people who knew her best could see right through it, and they couldn't help but feel that something was amiss. The math wasn't mathing. And that's when the police got involved. It was like a TV crime drama unfolding right in the heart of their quiet town. They had to start from scratch, piecing together the puzzle, trying to make sense of what happened to Bill. The investigators had their work cut out for them. They questioned Melanie, her friends, and family, trying to understand the dynamics of the McGuire marriage. They collected evidence, interviewed potential witnesses, and everything was on the table. 
As the investigation went on, some of Melanie's actions began to raise eyebrows. She had made certain purchases and carried out unusual tasks that didn't seem to align with the story that she was telling. People couldn't help but wonder about her intentions and whether she was hiding something. And honestly, the community started to become divided. Some believed in her innocence, saying that everyone reacts to tragedy differently, as I mentioned. Others, though, were convinced that Melanie was keeping secrets that held the key to her husband's mysterious disappearance. And just when you thought the story couldn't get any stranger, a discovery blew the case wide open and sent a shockwave through the town. A suitcase was found in the murky waters of the Chesapeake Bay. It had been discarded, seemingly hidden, but what made it truly shocking was what was inside. When the authorities opened that suitcase, they were met with a scene that could have come from the pages of a horror movie script. Inside the suitcase, they found dismembered human remains. Human legs, to be exact. The discovery left everyone in sort of a state of disbelief. And this gruesome find turned the investigation on its head. Days later, a second, larger suitcase was found with a human torso that had two bullet wounds and a head with one bullet wound. The authorities needed to connect the dots between the contents of the suitcases and Bill McGuire's disappearance. They used a facial reconstruction sketch to identify the remains as Bill McGuire. The town that once knew everyone's name and had a friendly wave on every corner was now engulfed in a sense of fear and suspicion. It went from, well, Bill is missing. He could be okay or maybe he's not, but we don't know for sure. But then with the suitcase discovery, it all got real, real fast. And at that point, all fingers pointed towards Melanie. The evidence was mounting and it became increasingly hard to believe that her hands were clean in this bizarre story. The police were piecing together a narrative that seemed to implicate her in a way that was hard to ignore. The investigators left no stone unturned. They found traces of cement in the suitcase, suggesting an attempt to weigh it down to the depths of the bay. Phone records revealed some questionable conversations, and gunpowder residue added another layer of complexity to the puzzle. Being in love can be a positive, driving force in your life, but it can also lead you down a treacherous path. Melanie had a secret, one that was hidden deep beneath the surface of her seemingly ordinary life. She was involved in a love affair with Dr. Bradley Miller, a man from where she worked. Their relationship added another layer of intrigue to the already weird story. It was a clandestine connection, and they tried to keep it hidden from their small town. As the details of this affair began to emerge, people couldn't help but question Melanie's intention and her role in how all of this happened. The investigation continued and was relentless, with pieces of incriminating evidence piling up against Melanie McGuire. Her actions and purchases became increasingly suspicious. For instance, she had purchased a 38 caliber handgun, the very same caliber used to kill her husband, Bill. The receipt for the gun also showed a nondescript 995 purchase, a sum that matched exactly the cost of two things in the whole store. One of those being wad cutter bullets, which happened to be the same type of ammunition used in Bill's murder. Also, security footage revealed a blurry image of someone moving Bill's car from the Flamingo Motel in Atlantic City around the time of his disappearance. Melanie initially claimed that she moved the car as a prank, but this story contradicted her earlier application for a protection order alleging abuse against her husband, Bill. If you're trying to get a protection order against someone you claim is abusing you, you aren't also playing fun, practical jokes on them. The evidence continued to mount against Melanie. Her affair with Bradley Miller, her easy pass toll record that showed she was in the area, then her attempts to remove that 90 cent charge from her easy pass account history to conceal her movements and other various inconsistencies it painted a pretty damning picture for Melanie. Forensic evidence added weight to the case against Melanie. The plastic bags in the suitcase that contained Bill's body parts were traced back to the same assembly line manufactured within hours of each other. A friend of the McGuire's came forward and said that Melanie had recently given them some of Bill's old clothes contained within identical plastic bags. 
Green fibers found on a bullet lodged in Bill's chest were linked to the couple's green couch, leading investigators to believe that a cushion or pillow had been used as a makeshift silencer during the murder. Medical-grade towels found with Bill's body matched those from Melanie's workplace, suggesting her access to drugs and medical supplies played a role in incapacitating her husband. The suitcases, made by Kenneth Cole, matched a three-piece set of luggage that the McGuire's owned. After more than a year of investigations, Melanie was arrested on June 2nd, 2005, while dropping her children off at daycare. She was taken into custody and booked on first-degree murder charges. She posted bail and was released. The trial began on March 5, 2007, nearly three years after the crime. The prosecution argued that Melanie's motive for the murder was her desire to start a new life with her lover, Bradley Miller. Melanie, on the other hand, continued to assert her innocence, claiming her husband had become increasingly moody, unpredictable, and was a compulsive gambler. On April 23, 2007, the jury reached a verdict, finding Melanie guilty of first-degree murder. She was also convicted of lesser charges, including perjury, desecration of human remains, and possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. However, she was acquitted of some of the charges against her, including hindering apprehension, tampering with evidence, and possession of Xanax without prescription. After her conviction, Melanie appealed for a new trial based on a jailhouse informant's claim that her husband may have been killed by Atlantic City mobsters. However, the informant's credibility came into question and the request for a new trial was withdrawn. On July 19, 2007, at the age of 34, Melanie McGuire was sentenced to life in prison. Her story, filled with twists, turns, and mysteries, came to a conclusion after being sentenced to a life behind bars. The case of the suitcase killer left an indelible mark on the town, reminding everyone that even in the quietest of communities, the darkest secrets can in most cases be concealed, but only for a time. That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host, and thank you so much for listening today. If you're new, hit subscribe so that you can more easily catch up on all the back episodes. Connect on social media, and you can see the pictures of what we talk about here on the podcast. Links for all that are in the show notes of this episode. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my email address is joe at 10minutemurder.com, or you can send me a DM on social media. And speaking of, uh, I've mentioned it before, but I need to mention it again, I think. If you send an email or a message, I 100% of the time will read it, but I don't always have the time to respond to it. I might be in the middle of doing uh, different things, and I think, well, I've got a few minutes. Let me read some of these messages. Let me read some of these emails. And I don't get a chance to respond to every single one of them because there's a lot happening in my life from time to time. And, you know, I take the opportunity when I have it to read these messages and read these emails. And that means that I'm not able to respond to everyone. I respond to as many as I possibly can, given the time that I have at that moment, but I don't get to 100% of them. Anyway, speaking of that, it reminds me of a message that I did not respond to, where someone said that when I say cement, sometimes it sounds like I'm saying semen. If I say cement, it sounds like semen. And they got confused in one of the episodes where I said cement and they thought I said semen. So it it reminded me of that during this story where I said cement. How do you say it? Is it it's some is it cement? That sounds not right to me. Cement? I thought it's cement. In the story today, the suitcase was not weighed down with semen. It was weighed down with cement. Cement. All right, that's going to do it. That is your episode for today. Thank you so much for listening to 10 Minute Murder. <laughs>